Seth Rogen really knew what he was doing, and Seth Rogen really did a service to not just the fans at heart, who are still kids at heart, of the Ninja Turtles, but also anyone new to the franchise, however young they may be, not so familiar with like the oldest stuff, like the OG animated series, maybe they never seen the first three original films, as terrible as the last one was when they went to feudal Japan. Uh, maybe all they know is the Michael Bay Turtles, which I feel really bad for them, unfortunately, if that's all they know. Maybe they only know the 2000, I think it was 3, yeah, 2003 version of the anime series that was on Fox 5 and everything, which is great. Who knows? It, it, it does its job as far as keeping loyal to the source material. That's how I feel. This movie right here, Mutant Mayhem. It's a whole string of things. It's a whole retelling of the story again. We're familiar, basically, with, like, the blueprints laid out of the OG origins of, you know, four baby turtles, you know, get a face full of ooze uh, dripped on them, like they were on Epstein Island against their will. They transform into humanoid turtles because Splinter was a human that was a rat that last touched a rat, at least in the cartoon, or I, I believe in the comics too, touched them, he turned into a humanoid rat... And then they turn into human turtles or teenage mutant turtles without the ninja because they had to learn the ninja part afterwards too. Then somewhere along the lines back in Japan, you know, Splinter when he was a human, he was enemies with uh, Shredder or Hokusaki. He comes back, conveniently enough, they all fall into the same city together, being New York, and then they're enemies at each other's throats. April O'Neil's thrown into the mix because who doesn't... Like a, a pretty white girl with red hair and big tits, like she used to have in the animated series, OG1, I mean, of course. Because they, they kind of like toned down her titties in the, uh, what, 2003 version. Which, no complaints. Still a good looking character, but you know, I, you know, come on. We know one version, just keep it at that one version. I'm just saying. But that's pretty much the premise, right? Well, believe it or not, and to no surprise of no one, they changed it again. But... Even though they changed it in Mutant Mayhem, it does work, surprisingly enough. Even if it's more for comedic effect, I did like it, and I did appreciate it, and I know that was discussed heavily as far as, do we change this shit up again? Do we do something different, or do we serve up the same old recipe we've been cooking forever now, and just give it to them like that? And the kids just gotta take it and try to understand it the way it was. Which wasn't bad. I mean, it wasn't terrible, it wasn't like, you know, um... If it ain't broke, don't fix it, kind of thing. But also, I do like the twists and turns, the changes they made to it. Because basically, this time around, uh, I believe, I, I, I do have to, you know, see if my memory serves me correct off of one viewing. Uh, excuse me. I have to see if my memory serves me correct off of this one viewing I did of Mutant Mayhem. I believe it was Baxter Stockman that, or someone looking like Baxter Stockman, because I think he was black in the comics, or white in the, in the games, and cartoon, no, he was black, wait, was he black in the animated series, and white in the comics, and they just kind of play like that racial ping pong back and forth as far as like switching the character up is concerned, I forget, I think here he was like some sort of white, ethnic white perhaps, he invented a whole slew, of, sorry, he created, he created a whole slew of mutants which had the mutant fly which was ambassador stockman which he turned into eventually in the cartoons or the original embodiments of the turtles so this time there's there's baxter stockman that creates a mutant fly mutant of its own he's not one of them that becomes the main bad guy in this film superfly once it grows up so it's i guess it's a, it's a fly humanoid something like that okay they got that one, it's a baby, they got Bebop, Rocksteady, they got uh, Mondo Gecko, Leatherhead, Wingnut, what was the other one they had? It was someone I think too, Bebop, Rocksteady, Wingnut, uh, Leatherhead, Mondo Gecko, oh, uh, Genghis Kong the Frog, that's already seven, and there was like another one, I think that was like a cockroach, like non-verbally speaking ass thing mutant as well but they were all created they were all created by Baxter Stockman TCRI wants to get a hold of all of them by hook or by crook 
and they break into the lab, explosion, boom, boom, pow, of course, because it's a laboratory, why wouldn't it blow up? I think presumably Baxter Stockman was dead, and they left, he left, all the mutants to their luck, so they all had to raise each other, Superfly being the leader, Superfly grows up to be Superfly the bad mutant, I guess, that wants to take over and kill all humans because they did him dirty as a baby and shit, voiced by Ice Cube, by the way, and a great job by Ice Cube. And then they're there, but also I believe the four turtles were a part of who were supposed to be the next mutants in line, but didn't get the mutant gen, obviously. They were able to escape to the sewers, and then some of the ooze fell through the grates, broke, they touched it. Splinter had his own little origin story, which was switched up too, because this time he was just straight up a rat. But then... He never touched no humans. That's the only problem. I was like, wait a second. He was a rat. And it was a funny origin, like, retelling of his own story. But he never touched no humans. He only dealt with other rats and or raccoons and possums as shown. But then he touches the ooze. And he becomes a giant rat that talks. Not necessarily a human, but he's like an old-ass man rat. Taking care of these four teenage mutant ninja... Well, teenage mutant turtles. Well, no... They transform, and that does make sense. They become mutant infant turtles, so not teenage yet. They have to all grow up. They have to spend years together getting familiar with one another or rat-raising turtles. He's going to make ends meet somehow, and then they do, and then flash forward to them being teenagers, and then he said, you know what? If I'm going to unleash into the streets, as we tried that one time, and humans don't like us, they look at us as freaks and shit too, I got to train you in the arts of, you know, ninjutsu and being ninjas be able to defend and protect yourself at all times which is funny how they do it because splinter goes into it being a father of four infant mutant turtles not knowing any martial arts himself so he has to learn via <laughs> i think it's more modern times you know the story so he has to learn via youtube and like instructional vhs tapes he teaches the turtle that way, the turtles that way, excuse me. And they all learn together as a family. Aw, very cute, right? So I do like how they, how they did that. That's the retelling of the story, pretty much. Versus what Michael Bay did, which is, I forget entirely. I think he, he was a pet rat. He touched the ooze, became a humanoid rat. But then he learned all the martial arts from a book. Like as, as big and, th and thick as a Yellow Pages. Learned it from there and then taught his sons that way. It was a mess. The Michael Bay movies, really, we don't need to touch on those too much because those were a big fucking hot mess. But whatever. So the Turtles now learn via YouTube and old VHS tapes how to be ninjas. And they're teens now at this point as the movie progresses and we finally get into the flesh of it all. So they do their thing. They become ninjas. They un unravel the skills. They discover the Superfly. There's a whole other uh, mutant in town. He's the big bad guy in this film too. He's the main, you know, antagonist in this case. But the real fun of the film is just like how they take the liberties of changing everything up from how you knew it to be before with, again, cartoons, movies, comics, whatever version of the Turtles you're familiar with and or love the most. They really did their thing this time around. And for the fact that they took the turtles and made them I'm going to be honest they are kind of annoying I, they would get on my nerves if I was Master Splinter Donatello for example we know him from past all versions of the turtles pretty much to be the one that's savvy with the tech and the genius low key and being able to invent shit and all that too this time around he's a straight up nerd which is different from you know being a geek because that would mean he knows how to fix shit or invent shit whatever he's a straight up nerd he knows a lot about anime He's in love with um, Attack on Titan and up on the new games and shit. He would be the one, oddly enough, I probably want to stuff into a locker most and or just straight cr try to crack his shell. Because he kind of came, not annoying bad, but more like annoying like he's got three brothers that will back him up. So he'll be the one with his chest all puffed out ready to like provoke and start the fight, presumably. And because the, the gag throughout the film is that he's got the big stick so like really what's he gonna do with a big ass stick in his possession right Mikey's still Mikey he's still like a dude he's still a bra he's still all about the cowbunga and, and shredding and you know 
tubular or whatever too. Not as like, you know, beach dude as he was in other versions, but like chill, kind of like cool kid, whatever. Raph is still a tough ass. He's already like, what, 12, 13, presumably he's already taking protein powders in his fucking milk in the morning with cereal. And Leo's still like, you know, cuck energy forced to be the leader it's it's so hard on me it racks my brain to be a leader of turtles that happened to be my brothers and ninjas as well in our teenage years and all that right but they kind of kept everything the same except for Dottie Dottie's no longer a geek and he didn't prove his like genius level tech inventions or experiments either he's just straight up a nerd he just knows a lot again like I said by anime games so you would assume you would make that stereotype to associate him with knowing all the shit, but he probably doesn't, it seems like. He just happens to know a lot of shit. Maybe he just does, does a lot of Googling, a lot of deep diving into YouTube. Who the fuck knows with Donnie? He, he just came off a little different this time. And also, um, something that they did different this time around is the love interest with April. For first off, also, April's black in this case and really nerdy, a kid at school, so about their age. Which they did in the 2012 version of uh, Ninja Turtles on Nickelodeon, the 3D looking one, which I actually liked. I grew to like that one a lot because first season might have been like weird, kind of sketchy looking what the fuck they do to Turtles. But towards the end of the first season, second season onwards, they really did a lot of different shit with that too. Took a lot of liberties as well. It just really made it like, I was loving the 2003 version before... Um, anything else or because I didn't have immediate access to the old animated series but then when 2012 came around with the Nickelodeon version I love that one a lot more like they just did so much more and just told more stories with it I, it's weird it's hard to explain you'd have to watch it yourself but definitely give it a chance um, this time around in the 2012 version it was Donatello who had a massive crush on also young teenage era year April O'Neil, who was in love and then fell in love with Casey Jones, which we got no hint of Casey Jones in this one, maybe the next one if they do a sequel, wink, wink. But Donatello was in love with April in that one. Now this time around, Black April has Leo, who has been identified as having no Riz whatsoever, let alone leader Riz and or teenage hormonal you know I, I love you I want to kiss your face because you're pretty Riz in this case uh, he strikes out every chance he gets with April towards the end of the movie he does seem like maybe possibly there could be something that goes on but doesn't seem like April's really willing because she's too busy being um, a teenager herself trying to run the school I think newspaper she was in charge of but then she became a reporter herself because at the end of the movie, Superfly becomes this whole giant monster, Godzilla-sized enemy. They got to take on and destroy the city. She's the only one to really report the real news as far as like, hey, wait a second, the turtles are actually here to help us. They're not the enemies. They, they are mutants, yes, and the teenagers, yes, they may be annoying in that sense, but they're here to save our ass from that big-ass mutant the size of Godzilla, the size capable of destroying and plowing through the whole city if we're not careful just by swinging his dick around too fast, if anything. Flaccid, mind you, not even hard, even though he's an insect. I don't know how that works. But she's able to do that. He's not able, presumably, to convince her to be with a turtle teenager, even though they might be around the same age, whatever. But that's okay, too, because we don't need the turtles having a love interest like that either. I don't think that ever really worked for the sake of the turtle lore, Betty had said. Maybe in the comic book something was different. I know that Raph at some point had like a girlfriend out in space that was like a, a lizard of some sort. Maybe she was a turtle too. I forget, but there's no need for that stuff. And also, um, every version of April before 2012, wh whether she was, I didn't know she was like, I don't, I don't want to say necessarily black, but apparently she was either like, she had some sort of melanin in her skin in the comic books, but just happened to, be, just happened to have the last name O'Neal, as some black people do. I've met an O'Neal before that was black that had that last name in the comics. Because, uh, what was I looking for? Oh yeah, so, according to the comic book version, the Mirage Studio version of April had dark brown slash black hair, not a redhead, 
and most incarnations of April are redheads. There is a frequent debate, however, even among Eastman and Liard, the creators of the Turtles, over April's ethnicity. When the character was first conceived, she was initially planned to be Asian, not even black or white, it doesn't matter, of course, Michael Jackson said that, but was named after an African-American woman that Eastman had once known, I told you, Black O'Neills. It sounds like a punk group, the Black O'Neills. Maybe I'll put that one together. Don't see like the fucking idea. Eastman has since claimed that April is supposed to be of mixed race, while Liard retains, excuse me, that April is Caucasian. Painfully white, that he had said. So, so white, her hair turned red. Straight out of Mama's pussy. In the September 1985 reprinting of issue one, ac actor, artist Ryan Brown depicts April as a katana-wielding ninja warrior in his back cover pinup. So, April is racially fluid, Betty had said, according to the creators, Eastman and Liard, as well as anybody else who got their filthy stinking hands on April O'Neil and catered her to whoever's liking it was. I like April O'Neil the best in the 80s cartoon because she's pretty, pink lips, red hair, and big tits. What more could you ask for besides that disgusting banana yellow jumpsuit with the camera outfit, cowgirl boots she had on. So yeah, we got that with April, right? So in this version, ah, you know, listen, we don't need to go into like the gender fluid, uh, not, not gender fluidity, excuse me. Now we're assuming April might be in the carpet more than she is in turtle shell. No, I meant to say, in this version, of course, as we already established, April is black, which doesn't matter because it seems like from the origins of the conception of April O'Neil, who the fuck knew what she was going to be? This guy wants her to be black with a white last name. This guy wants her to be Asian and look nothing like whatever the other guy was describing, and then the artist just said, you know what, just to make it a fucking ninja who has no visible traits that make her easily associated with a race in particular. And then, of course, you got the cartoon, which was pretty redhead with big tits, and then you got the uh, 2012, with like, they toned down the tits, she still got red hair and a pretty face, and then you got this version, she's black and young, with glasses, she throws up because, you know, she gets nervous and anxious like that. It's all a mix-up, it, it's all over the fucking place. What else can be said about this movie right now? Let's see. Hmm. No Casey Jones. No hinting. No nothing of that inclinations towards it. I'll spoil this for you. If you have not seen it yet, I guess you want to skip ahead a little bit. But if you stick around through the mid-credits, there's nothing at the end of the credits. Mid-credit bonus Easter egg. Superfly is defeated. Uh, presumably dead, I think. Yeah, probably something like that. All the mutants gather together, they go down to the fucking sewers to live with the turtles because they're all, you know, family like that. They're all, you know, related by mutant blood and shit. Um, they hint at, no, they don't hint at, they show the shadowing of Shredder. So, sequel coming, whenever it does, we get Shredder as the bad guy this time around. Which was weird because I would think by default it's so easy to just give a Shredder. Because he seemed to have been the bad guy that made the most sense in every embodiment of the Turtles. I will say, like, the one thing good, one of the very few things I could say good about the Michael Bay Turtles, was I think the first one, they depicted that Shredder as kind of almost invincible. So when he was, like, really beating the shit out of Raph and, like, cracking his shell with his bare hands, metallic hands, I mean to say, that was cool. But then, of course... Michael Bay, well, Michael Bay, he overdoes it, it's too much, boom, boom, pow, unnecessary explosion here and there, and half a city level because, you know, a turtle fell on his shell, couldn't get back up right away. But, Shredder being in the next one is pretty cool, and I'm looking forward to how they do it, especially with the humor, balancing with the action. The action's really good and beautifully animated here, too. Which, which Shredder being the next bad guy up in the sequel? Makes me think, it's sort of like another case of the Mario movie, which we just got now, some months ago, right? Why even do the live-action version they did, or they tried to do again with the Michael Bay version of the Ninja Turtles, why even bother doing that one, when they could have stuck to just an animated version that makes more sense, they could redraft, reanimate, throw the script out, do it all over again, to have it make sense, and or be loyal to the source material, because 
a lot of us also like to forget about a 2006 or 2007 version of the animated Ninja Turtles. That was a 3D animated one. I think Sarah Michelle Gellar was April or one of the female voices. I forget if she was even in that movie. But that was a good one that does get mentioned a lot. And or it gets overshadowed by, of course, afterwards Michael Bay, which was like, you know, one and two were pretty bad. I don't know how he made the second one worse. There was the winning formula with Megan Fox, I guess, but even her pretty ass, as proven time and time again, can't save a bad movie for him, bad as it should be. So, there is that to consider also. Hmm. It's a shame, too. Good looking girl. But, and also, she should have been a redhead, goddamn it. At least stick a fucking wig on her, like, what? 30 more minutes of fucking makeup, sitting her in a chair with big, bright blue eyes staring back at you while you, like, stitch in the fucking red hair onto hers to make her look like a redhead. Come on, that's not really a, a labor task in the look of that little beauty, right? I digress, though. That's the Michael Bay Turtles. That version, that 3D version of the Ninja Turtles was pretty good. At the end, I think there was, like, elemental shit involved and someone involved into an elder god almost to, like, almost defeat them, but of course the Turtles have to win. And then that also is the one where we finally got Raphael versus Leonardo. Not for the sake of who's going to lead the group, but more of who's better, period, pretty much. And the right Turtle won, as in Raphael beat Leonardo. Which, he's my favorite Turtle, because he's the one with anger issues. And he proved that even though you're the leader and the most skilled according to Father and or Sensei Master, doesn't mean you're the best. Raph has all the capabilities and skills of being the leader if he really wanted to, but he can't get himself under control enough to be the leader. So that's the uh, internal conflict and struggle of being the most powerful and strongest of the turtles, but the one that's most internally torn apart. And or his own worst enemy, Betty had said. But that's that version of the turtle aside from this one, Mutant Mayhem. This is the one we're talking about. Um, with the humor, there's a lot of good jokes in here too. I'm surprised, but like the writing... The way the jokes land and stick. There's a lot of... If you're above a certain age... Then a lot of the references and or the jokes... The slang, Betty had said, might go over your head. Or you're going to be left scratching your head. If you have any hair left, you know, you're better off than me, period. But only because I know the songs of today somewhat thanks to TikTok and Instagram. I do know the words. It does go beyond lit. So you're going to have to upgrade if, you know lit is as far as you know there's a lot of that shit they pay homage oddly enough and funny enough to ferris bueller's day off which i thought was great and the fact that they loved it they didn't shit on it like oh who's this old ass white guy he's unhip that was like being a teen in 50 years ago who gives a shit no they actually praised it they loved it um that was cool that was a nice little fucking thing they actually used actual footage from ferris bueller's day off so shout out to matthew broderick for doing his thing with that shit um, and there's a lot of homage being paid. Oh, by the way, let's not forget Jackie Chan is Master Splinter too, which was, I like Jackie Chan, don't get me wrong. Who doesn't? He's like a fucking awesome guy. You know, there's, there was that one clip they shared recently, I think on YouTube or the socials of him and his daughter watching a lot of his own stunts he's done during the various films he's made throughout his career and him like kind of tearing up with just like how amazed she seems to be taken by all the stuff he's done throughout his film career, but it, it looks like her her look turns more to that of concern, realizing like what he's done to his body throughout his whole career. So he tears up seeing that like kind of pain in her, like, oh my God, my dad really put himself through the mill just trying to put like food on our table. I'm sure he's rich, but also for the sake of our entertainment at the end of the day, doing his own stunts and like breaking shit all, all the time, I'm sure. But Jackie Chan did a good job as Master Splinter, surprisingly, even though, and not to be racist, please don't take it as such, his accent was so heavy at times, it was kind of like, I wish I could kind of hear it back, or I wish it would have been captioning on the fucking, um, on the screen where I watched that. But it wasn't so terrible, I couldn't understand every other fucking thing, it was like 95% of the shit I understood, it was just a couple of lines like, I, I wish I could have heard that again, or they would have like done that one over again, but he's great, he's got great comedic timing of course, so Jackie Chan can never fail in our eyes, there's a lot of references, and a lot of, I guess, 
name dropping and or product placement throughout the film because they have to go complete a shopping list at some point and they got Doritos, they've got, you know, they're naming shit by their actual trademark name. So it's not like, oh, we got to grab a bag of chips with ranch flavoring. No, it's like we got to grab the Cool Ranch Doritos, we got to grab the Pepsi, we got to grab the this and the that. I don't mind. And hey, if that financed the movie to let it happen, and or maybe the studio said, hey, if you get product placement, you get these companies to fucking sign on and like pay you to have their shit put in the movie, then we'll let you do the movie you want to Seth Rogen, whoever else involved. Maybe that's how that worked. I don't know. But there's a lot of product placement, a lot of straight up brand stamping in the film throughout. So a lot of recognizable names. And surprisingly enough, the film does pay homage in the sense of, surprisingly, the soundtrack, the music throughout. Because Seth Rogen's made it clear, along with Jonah Hill, even though I don't know if Jonah necessarily had anything to do with this film or its making, has made it clear he's a hip-hop head. And he loves it so much so that he had not just any old fucking random, I just stick that in there, see if it works at the end of, like, post-production whatever, but you could tell... With the music choices made for the film and what was selected and put in, there was a lot of love involved. And not just that, while the making of the movie happened, but also he thought of it, he suggested it, they got it, they got the licensing to put it in the fucking movie, and then he was there throughout the post-production too, while the editing was being put together and be like, no, maybe take this part out, spread this out so that like, the music can actually hit in sync with what's going on on the screen, because... The best example for me of that was, and very evident how much Seth gives a shit about the entities he's involved with, is De La Soul's I Know from Three Feet High and Rising. Because that's used while they're kind of flashback into Splinter raising the baby turtles before the teenagers. It's beautifully done. I love that song. I love that album. De La Soul's my favorite group of all time. Uh... EPMD after them immediately and of course rest in peace to Dave but they use that beautifully they open up with Anti Up from MOP twice in the film mind you they got <laughs> oh, oh fucking things this was so random push it to the limit from the Scarface soundtrack twice as well and both times one two they work effectively so genius I loved it fucking black street no diggity which makes no sense immediately to associate that with the turtles but during one of their fight scenes as you know the turtles are hunting down superfly and making sense of everything uh gluing everything together to see where they can track down superfly no diggity's playing and it works beautifully so more money for dr dre and i know he's not complaining about it. he's like oh yeah you want to use me in a ninja turtle movie yeah i got y'all go ahead i'm dr dre i'm good for it Shimmy Shimmy Ya from Old Dirty Fucking Bastard of all things. Rest in peace, ODB. ODB, Ninja Turtles. The connection has finally been made. I don't know how or why it happened, but God bless Seth Rogen or whoever's in charge and assigned the task of selecting the sauce for the film. I love that part. The fact that Shimmy Shimmy Ya of all things, Shimmy Shimmy Ya, Shimmy Yam, Shimmy Ye, of all things is used in the Ninja Turtle movie. So this is for kids, they'll get exposed to Shimmy Shimmy Ya, so hopefully we'll get, we already have Young Dirty Bastard, shout out to him, but maybe we'll get more ODBS inspired influenced artists coming up in the next batch of rappers, whatever, which might be next week, because you know, SoundCloud and all that shit, with the internet available, everybody's a fucking rapper at this point. Four non-blondes, what's up? And I say, hey, 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 hey. That's used beautifully, and it's a fucking dance remix of it, too. At the end, of course, they got to throw in a Tribe Called Quest, because if they were going with De La Soul, that's native tongue enough to fucking keep it right there. But then on top it off to fucking put the cherry on top, Tribe Called Quest, can I kick it? Rest in peace to fight, of course. Um, I would have loved to have seen, like, some sort of uh, animated version of Tribe in the film some way, somehow, is like, I don't know, hot dog vendors or something, or like Fife Dog, you know, kicking over a can or something like that, I don't know, but that was great to end it off with, and also, they didn't use it in the film, as far as the song's concerned, but Ice Cube directly references himself a couple of times, his old shit, I think from The Predator, and I think Death Certificate, I, I don't remember the name of the song, so don't tease me on, don't, don't um, quiz me on that, but then also Ice Cube directly, as yeah, Superfly, of course, directly references 
fucking super duper fly, as in fucking hey Missy Elliot when he does the reference. So that was fucking awesome. Shout out to Missy Elliot too. She's really underrated, especially her old stuff. The first two albums are, are like classics. But then, how do you do? The songs using the movie Justice if you don't also pay homage to low key, probably the best thing to come out of not just the original movie trilogy, but specifically the second one, Secret of the Ooze. I mean, Super Shred will be fucking awesome if we get that in the sec in the sequel to this one. But it's already a great start with them actually playing a snippet, it's very short, less than five seconds, but they got it. They threw ninja rap from Vanilla Ice in there. Ninja, ninja, rap. It's in there. And it's beautiful. It's great to hear. It's very brief. I wasn't mad at it, though, but I was like, fuck, it works. Fuck it. And it's in a fight scene. They're fighting in, like, a, a mechanic workshop, a bunch of cars surrounding them. They kick one of the fucking engines. The car turns on. There's ninja, ninja, rap. So that works. I was, it, it really covered all bases, I feel, with paying homage and respect to the franchise, the old embodiments. They did their thing with it, too, as well. It, it's, it's the perfect balance. If I had to give this a final score, do what you can and pretend you're flailing in the air in an Elvis jumpsuit. Okay, um, is it okay if I at least improvise because I'm Elvis in the air in despair. I, I didn't mean to rhyme. It's just, and I'm not trying to write an original Elvis tune. I'm just uh, trying to get into the mindset of Elvis in the air kind of thing. So it's all just him on a string, most likely in a dark room, you know, cut close to his face so it doesn't look like he's not there, but it's so clear, like a sore thumb sticking out that he's not there in the air. But then again, it's all right. He don't got to be doing his own stunts like that either. So, of course, they cut to him when he's like maybe five feet off the ground. I mean, I, I got to go with a two out of two. This is easily my favorite Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle movie out of all of them. And I'm including the OG trilogy, the 2007 3D animated one, the Michael Bay, two of them. And also including, this is better than also... Batman meets Ninja Turtles, as well as the Turtles Forever animated special, which like brought all generations together in one film, which I strongly recommend both of those two as well, on top of this one. But this is the epitome of them all. Funny, full of action, hilarious, pays homage and respect enough to the source material where it, everything works. It's just beautiful. It's Gucci. Two out of two shells. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle, Mutant Mayhem, it's wonderful, it's great, I got nothing bad to say about this thing at all, I really enjoyed it, and I'm gonna make time purposely this week coming up, just to go see it again. Yo, it's over, alright, it's over, it's over, move the mic, move the mic. Thank you! Alright.